Loretta with Variety, and I'm your host for today's Half Hour with Red, White, and Royal Blue. Today, we are joined by Matthew Lopez, the director, co-writer, and EP of Red, White, and Royal Blue. Uh, Matthew, if you want to just kind of start off with giving us a quick overview of the film. Yeah, Red, White, and Royal Blue is a film about uh, uh, Alex Claremont Diaz, played by Taylor Zakar Perez, who is the son of the U.S. president, played by Uma Thurman. Uh, and Prince Henry, played by Nicholas Galitzine, who is the grandson of the King of England, played by Stephen Fry. Uh, they uh, are mortal enemies who, uh, at a royal wedding, get into an altercation that ends up uh, creating uh, headlines. Uh, and they have to pretend to be best friends, and they actually do become good friends, and then they become secret lovers and they have a whirlwind romance that ends with them uh, changing the world a little bit and changing their own lives. I love that so much. Um, before we go any further, we're going to dive into the trailer. I sent you to the royal wedding, a simple instruction. Don't cause an international incident. How's it going? You've done some pretty stupid things in your day, but this... Thanks for cake. Henry shoved me. An urge I currently share. What I need is some good old-fashioned damage control. Need a boy. The White House and the palace are going to release a joint statement. We can argue, we can fight. You've got to be joking. You can hate Prince Henry all you want. My NDA is bigger than yours. I want you to know that. You're wearing lifts. You know that too, sweetheart. You better act like the sun shines out of his ass and you have a vitamin D deficiency. I think thought is what you might say to convince the world that we're actually friends. I love hanging out with this guy. These days are way too lonely. We're never have to see each other again. You're expected at my New Year's party. Don't forget the love away, but I want... Did I do something wrong? Do you ever wonder who you'd be if you were an anonymous person in the world? I have no idea what you're talking about. Christ, you're as thick as it gets. Of your majesty. It's your royal highness. Oh. Dear Alex, I miss you. That's what I really want. Good morning. We are in a hotel crawling with reporters. If anyone sees you leave this hotel, I will Brexit your head from your body. Your royal highness. You need to figure out if you feel forever about him. Do you love him? What difference would it make if I did? I want someone to love. Prince Henry belongs to Britain. I need. We can figure out a way to love each other on our own terms. It's like there's a rope attached to my chest and it keeps pulling me towards you. Hopefully we'll get through tonight without any more scandals. <laughs> the night is young, Ma. That's what I want! <laughs> so much fun to watch that. Uh, I, I kind of want to just start with how, how this kind of came about and was brought to you, whether you had already read the book and kind of what that process was like. Yeah, I... My agent sent me the book in early 2020. I had just opened my play, The Inheritance on Broadway. And he he thought maybe I would I would maybe think about turning it into a musical. And that was the beginning of my introduction. That was my introduction to it. I read it in like a day and a half because I I just devoured it. And I I called him on Monday and I said, yeah, maybe a musical, but well, let's talk about the movie. And I I called Greg Berlanti because he was one of the producers of The Inheritance. And I, I just said, Greg, I have to make this film. Please, please, please. Uh, I, I, you know, just, just, just give me a chance to put my, to make my case. And um, it was a little too early in the process. They had just gotten the rights and all this stuff. And so I, a year went by and I, I kind of let go of the hope and I just sort of moved on to other things. And and then I got a phone call uh, from Sarah Schechter and we started to talk and that's, that's really how the book came into my life. And that's how I, I really, I very shamelessly went after, <laughs> after this thing because Not I really, shameless. well, I felt very strongly about, about the book and I felt so strongly about the characters and, and, you know, it's, it's very rare that you encounter a, a story with a, a young Latin lead who's, who's such a, 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 a positive uh, uh, depiction of, 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 of young, of young queer Latin a life. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to be the person who put Alex and, and Henry's story into the world. Yeah. 100%. I'm curious for you about 
why it was that this story was so connected to you. I know you talked a little about this, but if you could talk a little about the personal connection that made you want to do this. You read a book and it just gets into your your imagination and and you know the the act of writing is the act of sharing and uh once you share something in the world it becomes someone else's and it belongs to all the millions of people who read the book or watch the film or see the play and i had this sense of of this weird sense of ownership over it i just i it i i knew that casey wrote it but it it became a part of me they really those two characters really did just burrow into my heart and so uh, yeah, it was it it felt so weirdly natural to to just sort of say this is this this is going to be my project. And, um, you know, you, you you're lucky if that happens a few times in your career that you you absolutely can't you couldn't live with yourself if you didn't try to make this film. And I, I don't know what my life would be without uh, without these characters in it and without the experience of having made this as my first film. Yeah, absolutely. What, uh, I guess, what was the process of working with Casey on this? Because obviously in any book adaptation, there's some sort of collaboration, whether they're very involved or they kind yeah. of let you take the reins. So what was that kind of like, that collaboration? Casey Casey was, was actually very busy. I remember at the time working on another book and, and gave me the courtesy and the respect of leaving me alone. And I mean that like in a very positive mm -hmm. way, like uh, Casey just trusted me and and I appreciated and I never took for granted that trust. And as a result, whenever I needed, I was like, I would call Casey and I'd be like, Casey, what 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 do you what do you what, help me understand this? I'm 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 stuck and and really be, kind of became like my guru as I was working on this thing and. You know, the biggest, I think perhaps the most controversial, like, you know, I said, like, you know, making a, a two hour movie is not the same as a 400 plus page book. And there were inevitably things that weren't going to fit into the film. And, and and I think perhaps the most potentially controversial change that I decided to make was uh, in the book, of course, Alex has a sister, uh, June. And as I started to work on the film, I, 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 I was looking at my early pages and I was just like, there's nothing that June is doing in this film, independent from the book. There's nothing that June is doing so far in the film that Nora couldn't do. And I realized quickly that what was happening was I was writing the potential for two young women to have two small roles. And maybe the answer was if we if we if we don't have June in the film and give her material to Nora, then you've got the chance for one young woman to have a pretty good part. Mm -hmm. And I convinced Casey of this. I think it was perhaps one of the most unexpected calls for me of like, I want to cut June from the film. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, why? And and I explained it to them and 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 I and I got Casey to to see it and 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 again Casey trusted me and and I know that was the right decision and, and it was it was it was but it was, you know, it was risky because June is a fan favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, fan favorite for me, for sure. So, <laughs> but I, I understand and it ended up being great. So um, before we continue, I want to throw to one more clip so we can just right. give people a look. Good morning. <laughs> Zara? Breathe. Don't you tell me what to do. Okay. Do you want to sit? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Where, where, where do you want to go? Just here? Yeah. Oh, there? Okay. Yeah, fine, fine. I'm fine. Oh, okay. How long has this been going on? Since New Year's. Oh, God. And who knows about this? Literally no one but you. And the Secret Service. And Percy. Right, and Nora. Oh, and I told my sister. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she was really happy for us. Oh, I can't wait to see her again. She's really... Okay. Shut up, okay? The both of you. I need the thing. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> so fun. It's so that, fun. That, that comedy genius that is Sarah Shahi. Yes, absolutely. Well, it kind of, obviously with the two of them, but also with Sarah, with Uma, how did you, what was the co casting process like this? Because I think a story like this, especially when you read the book, the chemistry, not just between the two of them, but between everyone has to be right. And you nailed it. So what was that kind of process like? 
I mean, it was an incredibly thorough process. We 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 spent months casting this thing. You know, we we really knew. I mean, look, we all went into this process knowing that the there was a high chance to screw it up, and there was a there was a slim chance of getting it right. And the only way we knew we were going to get it right was to be very thorough. And and we had an obligation to the book's fans to do that, and ob- an obligation to our own love of the story. And and um. Yeah, I saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of of guys for Alex and Henry. I mean, hundreds. And uh, with Nick and Taylor, they individually really sort of rose very quickly to the top uh, for me. And we we found Nick first. And it was very, once I met Nick, and sort of working with him, I was pretty, I, there was no question that he was my Henry. And we started pairing him with a bunch of different guys for Alex. And when we got, and the last pairing that we did was was Taylor. And, you know, some of those those chemistry was like, oh, yeah, I can see that working. Oh, yeah, that might, that might, that might, that might work. Then, then, yeah, I think there's, there's potential there. And then Nick and Taylor got on a Zoom together and they started playing around and I it took less than five minutes. And I, 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 I took my phone out and underneath the table, I texted my producer, Sarah Schechter. And I was like, that's them. There they are. We're done. And, uh, they kept going for another hour. And I realized, I realized like they, they didn't realize that they were, they had, they weren't auditioning anymore. We were just rehearsing. (laughs) You know, I figured, well, I have an hour of their time. Let's get to work. And, um, yeah, the casting of this Uma, Oh, when, I mean, I, of course, I've just been in love with Emma Thurman for for years, and 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 that she wanted to meet with me on this film and and to get a chance to talk to her about it, and that we quickly realized that our desires for her were very aligned for Ellen. Uma saw in Ellen what I saw in Ellen, and we we saw very quickly the potential for us to collaborate on the, on this on this character uh, very fruitfully, and so. Um, I was very, we were also very happy when she came aboard, but everybody, I mean, Sarah Shahi, Stephen Fry, Cliff, uh, uh, and, and, and Ellie and, and Rachel and, and, and Anish, uh, uh, I'm just, I'm naming the whole cast now, but like, it really is Thomas Flynn. Um, we just, we just got so very lucky with this cast and it was a result of a very, very thorough search, but you know, you can search all you want and, and if they don't appear then you don't have a cast yeah absolutely what role was the toughest for you to cast i mean it was yeah it was alex and henry it was it was it was it was it was them because they had to shine as individuals and they had to to really work as a team Mm -hmm. and when i say i mean i i just spent i saw hundreds and hundreds of tapes hundreds of tapes and i wanted to leave no stone unturned so we spent, I, I think we spent the better part of five months casting those roles. That's so wild to me. Um, so obviously you you brought up Greg Berlanti earlier and obviously working closely with Sarah Schechter on this. Telling LGBTQ plus stories are so important today, but obviously Greg is, I mean, he told the first gay love story I saw on TV with Dawson's Creek. So he was obviously such an expert in that as well as, as well as you are. So what was that collaboration like? Well, I mean, I was a first-time filmmaker. I had written a few screenplays up to that point, but I had never put them into practical action before. And and you know, with Greg and Sarah, it I felt like I owe them money for the film school that they put me through. You know, and uh, they they were incredibly patient with me. They they gave me so much support. I had a very long. Uh, Sarah was very adamant that I have a very long pre-production process, probably longer than a more practiced filmmaker would need for, for, for this film. But um, they really set me up for success. And uh, you know, there, there is no one in this business who, who you want reading your script for, for, for romance, for, for, for queer content, for, for queer characters than Greg. And, and there is no producer in this business that I want, fighting for me than Sarah Schechter. Um, you know, if you've got Sarah Schechter in your, in your corner, you will succeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I was set up for success by 
two of the best producers in the business. I, I'm curious how you feel about whether it's viewed as a a love story or a queer story or queer, if there's a combination of that and kind of how you feel about that because I've seen a lot of conversation about that on the internet. I don't really care as long as people watch it. Uh, I love that answer. Yeah, it can be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> it's still the same movie, you know. Yeah. Um, however people choose to access it for whatever reason they choose to access it, it's fine. Um, it's not my business really how people categorize mm. it, you know. Um, it's not it's not my movie anymore. Uh, and it will always, in my mind, be the movie that I I believe it is. Um, but it belongs to everyone who sees it now. So if they want to call it a you know, crime saga, they can call it that. I, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, it belongs to that. It belongs to the people who watch it now. Yeah, hundred um, percent. One thing I I've been talking actually a lot about recently is the power of rom coms kind of coming back around, <laughs> where we fell in love with them in the early aughts, and I wish that they were never left. But how do you think? How do you feel about that? And kind of why why this resurgence of the power of a love story on TV and and film? I think I think it's a I think it's a, it's always a cyclical and generational thing. I think you know that, that we I think we probably just went through this ebb of people you know getting old enough to not not need the comfort perhaps of of a rom com mm -hmm. and then another generation comes of age and they need the comfort of a rom com. Um, they I mean rom coms are one of the earliest you know uh, genres of filmmaking and and. And they've never really gone away, I think. Uh, but we are living in a golden age right now, I think. And and um, we've there have been other golden ages. And this golden age will end and then other people will rediscover them. And, you know, one of the things that I, I'm very excited about this movie being in the world is that, like, people are still talking about it right now. People are still very, very passionate about it right now. And that's great. And then, you know, maybe 10 years go by and like everybody's moved on to other things and that's great. And then maybe, you know, one of the things that I love is that during the pandemic, younger audiences discovered Moonstruck for themselves. Now mm -hmm. Moonstruck, I I, rem I have a distinct memory of my parents going to see Moonstruck and coming home and like talking about it and laughing. And and then, you know, when I, when I was in college, I probably watched it for the first time and Moonstruck was a, such a, an important film to me. And then you have younger generations now during the lockdown and they're like, have you seen Moonstruck? And I'm like, yes, I've seen Moonstruck. Uh, but you're like, the, welcome to the party. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, that's really how it should be. 100%. Um, I, I, I do want to ask you because I feel like as this, your directorial debut for a feature film also being the writer, what was that balance like for you and able to do both? And do you want to do more of doing both of those? Yeah, I mean, I, where, where it came in handy was being on set and, you know, just being able to like lean on my theater training and being on set and like watching perhaps like the mat, like we are shooting the master and going, well, this scene's not working in practice, in theory on the page, it worked just fine, but now we've got these actors doing it and it's not working. And, 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 um, you know, I have the other thing is I have no one to blame, but myself, if it wasn't working, um, <laughs> I, I really love writing. I love writing for, with the intention of directing because I can get incredibly specific. I can, um, I, I, I try not to think too much about the practicality at first. Eventually, practicality has to come into play. Um, I I I really love being able to envision from beginning to end what a film might be. Um, that for me is really exciting. Mm. Um, and you know, I kept you know I kept writing throughout production, and then in post production, you 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 you're still writing and. Um, that I love, but you know, as a filmmaker too, I, I in the in the time since the film has been released um, over the last several months, I've I've been sent other people's scripts, you know, and mm -hmm. as a director and and reading other people's work has been so exciting, and and uh, there's also something very nice about receiving a story already well told and mm -hmm. and 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 getting to work with another writer to guide them to make it even better. And then would you also write and then have another director come on and strictly serve as a writer? Absolutely. You know, I, I, um, I think I, I, look, I, I am so, I, I, I love telling stories and I, I, there are some movies I think that would come along and I was like, you know, I would love 
to write that. I have no desire to make that film. That mm. sounds like I that sounds like it would age me 10 years. But I I you go have you go go up into the Andes in the middle of winter and, and make that film. Sure. I'll write that for you. Yeah. Mm. But um I, you know, there are the but then there are the projects that are just so personal to me that I know that I need to 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 do it from uh, from suits and nuts, you know, and yeah. uh, and um, you know those projects when you see them too, for sure. Um, obviously, you guys had to, had released a couple like extra footage, deleted scenes, sort of things. Do you want to release more of that? Is there a lot of this extra footage that's on the ground that we're kind of waiting for? Yeah, I mean, you know, you you start to get into the game of like releasing uh uh cut scenes, and then and then you know the. the what I don't ever want to do is have people start to second guess the decisions that we made that went into the the final film. And, and, and honestly, I know that there, <laughs> the worst mistake I ever made doing press as a director for this film was, was talking about the, um, the, 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 the assembly, you know, and assembly, you know, assemblies are naturally very, you know, very long and, 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 and ungainly things. And, uh, and I think people would like mis mistake, that had mistaken that for like, oh, there's three hour cut. Know, of course, there's not a three hour cut of this film. But <laughs> my big worry is that, you know, I don't I don't want people to start to not love the film as it is. And I don't want people to start to think about what could have been uh, if the film had been longer or had more in it. And the, I, we all stand by the film that we've made. And so I don't think there'll be any more uh, cut scenes coming out just because... Uh, I just, I just don't want to start people. I don't want people to start to, to take their eyes off the thing that that we made and the thing that they love. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, it's, it's such a perfected amount of yeah. of content. Those two scenes, those two scenes that we did release, they were they were sort of perfect for that because you know I think the Cornetto scene is a scene that you know obviously we we filmed and it's it's very iconic in the novel and and I I. I, I I was sort of loath to cut it, but I also knew that it it was the right decision to cut it out of the film, and then we were really happy to share that. And then you know, I mean, the the speech was like you know, <laughs> it, it was a little bit of it was quite a bit of guilt actually. I was like Nick Nick did such great work on that, and we you know we we worked really hard on that scene, and you know I actually fought for the for for the ability to film that scene. And, and we took it, you know, we, we, it was a lovely, it was just great work for Nick. Nick, I think did it seven times in a master. And then we, we did a little bit of coverage. Uh, and, and then I, it was one of the harder moments to have to talk to an actor and go, so the speech. Uh, yeah. And I, I think it was <laughs> sort of like, I owed Nick Gallat seen a little bit of karma back. And Ooh. so it's just like, you know, and it's just, it's just lovely that Nick's great and, and and Taylor is too. And so sharing that was, that felt like a bit of a no brainer as well. For sure. Well, we like to end all of these with the same final question. Uh, in case someone hasn't had the chance to see Red, White and World Blue, what is the one thing about the film that would stand out to you the most that would make someone want to check it out? I think it is unabashedly and unapologetically romantic and uh, hopeful and, uh, that it is filled with gorgeous, luminous performances from actors at the top of their game across the board. 100%. That's a great answer. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you guys to our friends at Prime Video and to Matthew for joining us today. To thank everyone you. watching, thank you to joining with Half Hour With. Thank you so much.